Good morning, everyone. Uh, I will mention again that we will start in a couple of minutes. In the meantime, please uh, write down in the chat box your name and uh, your role and the organization, please. Okay, I will start. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michela Bazzino and I'm the Circular Economy Specialist at the REC project. And welcome to the first uh, REC Global Information Session on a Circular Economy. A very quick introduction on the REC project for the people who doesn't know and are not very familiar with the, with the REC project. Um, it's a project started uh, in uh, 2021 and is hosted by the Global Logistic Cluster. Our main goal is to embed environment, to support organizations to embed environmental sustainability in their operation, with a focus on waste and uh, greenhouse uh, gas emission. We, in, we work to increase knowledge and uh, uh, awareness uh, in, uh, in the community, but we also provide the technical expertise and advice to or the organization in need. Uh, we work with a um, community of more than 500 uh, organizations, uh, considering also the academia, the private sector, and for sure uh, UN and NGOs and uh, local uh, partners. And uh, our uh, work stream are for uh, the circular economy, green procurement, greenhouse gas emission, and waste management. Um, as mentioned, today is the first uh, global info session on circular economy, the first one of four. And the uh, idea is that uh, we will see together what the circular economy means and the uh, different phases of the circular economy. Today, we'll see together uh, what circular economy is uh, and uh, what means uh, circular economy model. And we'll deep dive into the design and producing phase. And uh, in 2024, we'll have other three sessions and we will focus on the supply phase of the circular economy, on the end of life, so meaning of uh, meaning reusing, repairing, refurbishing the products that we have in our supply chains. And then the fourth session will be more about uh, communicating circular economy and engaging with the other stakeholders. Today, um, as mentioned, we we'll see circular economy as a model and that several phases of circular economy. We'll see together the benefits and the challenges, and we'll understand why it's so relevant for the humanitarian sector. And we'll focus on the design and production phase to design circular products. We'll have with us uh, Ignazio Matteini from uh, UNHCR to explain what they are doing in terms of circularity and in terms also of design of uh, circular products. And then we give practical advice and some tips on how to start and where to start to design these circular products. And we'll have uh, the green procurement specialist to support us in this uh, discussion. But let's start with a big definition. I know it's a little bit scary and it's the only thing that we need to read together to better understand what we are talking about. So circular economy is a model of production and consumption, which reduces material use with design products and services to be less resource intensive. The circular economy model aims to maintain the value of the products and materials for as long as possible by returning them into the value chain at the end of the use. This is done while minimizing the generation of waste, the greenhouse gas emission, pollution, and the negative impact on ecosystem. I know it's a little bit scary and it's quite, it seems quite complex, 
but I think it's very useful to see these two graphs to understand very in deep what circular economy means. And we need to compare the linear economy model with the circular economy model. At the moment, our economy, our the structure of our society is mainly structured around a linear economy approach. This means that we take resources, we extract raw material. With this material, we produce what we need, our products, our food, whatever. Then we use this, and then in the end, we simply dispose it. This, this approach and this model is very easy to apply, but it's quite clear that it's not sustainable in the long term, and it has a huge negative impact on the environment. At the beginning, when we extract material, also considering that these materials are not infinite, right? So at one point, this will be not possible. And also at the end of the process, when we dispose, we start to face a huge crisis in terms of waste management and all the products that we don't know how to manage at the end. On the other hand, there is the circular economy that provides a solution to this gap. The circular economy has the same phases, more or less, simply structured in a circular way. So again, we extract material at the beginning, we design and we produce the products that we need, we supply it, and then there is the end of life where we reuse it, repair it, refurbish, remanufacture, repurpose, and so on, and recycle, and we introduce again in the same circle. These help us to, for sure, reduce the negative impact that we mentioned before, talking about greenhouse gas emission, talking about waste management produced at the end, or also in the, the impact on the, on the ecosystems, but also we retain the same value, the same value, the same object, and this is also sustainable on the economical side. Um, but why it's so important for the humanitarian sector? Um, we need to understand this in order to properly apply it. Let's start with the first one that for us is the most important, let's say, uh, as, uh, as REC, and this is the environmental impact, the positive environmental impact. This means because as humanitarians, we are committed to the principle of do not harm. This means that when we provide support to the community or to um, a specific country, we need to make sure that we don't impact in a negative way the environment. Uh, and the circular economy supports us to, in doing this because it focuses on minimizing the greenhouse gas emission during all the production or supply phase, and also minimize also the, um, the waste produced at the end, and also minimize the raw material that we need to extract at the beginning. So all these aspects help us to not only diminish our negative impact on the environment, to have an environmental positive impact. Then the cost saving aspects. When we talk about money in the long term, we need to think that the circular economy provides benefits for the organization. And uh, it can be very beneficial, and this is also something that we need always to promote. And this in terms of revenues for the organization, but also in terms of saving at the beginning. When we talk about saving, it's because if we have always the same products in the same circle, we need to consider that sometimes we don't need to buy new products because we can use the same products that are that we already have. And this make us spend less money in purchasing. But also at the end, when we have a product, for example, that we don't need anymore, when we have, for example, waste, plastic waste, so cardboards that we don't use anymore in our warehouses, we need to think that we can sell this material and we can have some revenues in the organization. Again, so these are two aspects that we can, see, we can consider in the economic side of the circular economy. And then there is the uh, economic opportunities also for local stakeholders. This create, in fact, an environment that is not only related to the organization, to the humanitarian organization, but includes also the local stakeholders. And we are talking about local companies, uh, local workers, 
because the circular economy can create uh, new uh, green jobs and also economic opportunities for sure for the local uh, governments. For sure, it's not easy. Uh, we don't want to sell circular economy as the most uh, easy model to apply. It's very, very challenging, but uh, that's the solution for the future. And we need to mention also the challenges and identify possible solutions. The main challenge, I would say, in my view, is the mindset. We need to change our mindset. And uh, when there is a change, we all know that there is always a huge difficulties, a huge barriers. We can overcome this challenge, uh, creating awareness, uh, providing trainings, and the REC project can support you in this. Uh, you, um, we produce some documents explaining what circular economy is, uh, providing advice on how to implement circular economy and which are the benefits to implement circular economy. And you, what, to change the mindset, you need to remember also that you need to talk internally, your organization, about circular economy to promote the, the principle of the circular economy. Then another challenge is the multiple stakeholders. I mentioned before that is good because circular economy has works and, and needs the collaboration of many stakeholders at the local level. So it's a benefit, but it's also a challenge because we know that when we need to coordinate with the different actors, it can be challenges. But again, uh, the REC is here to support you uh, in creating uh, um, connection between several actors, especially when we talk about the humanitarian uh, uh, level. And then another challenge is the initial investment. Before I say that in the long term, circular economy can be beneficial in terms of economic, but at the beginning, for sure, it needs a change. Every change needs an investment in terms of money. Um, our advice and what we promote always at REC is to talk with the, your management, to talk with your donors about circular economy. And when you have a project that you want to implement related to sustainability and related to a circular economy, always mention that uh, at the moment, for example, the donors are extremely interested in implementing, in funding and providing support to implement projects related to, to this topic. So. Don't be shy and share this with your donors, with your management. That can be sometimes also support. But now uh, I would like um, to deep down a little bit more on one of the phases. I hope that more or less the idea of circular economy is clear. If it's not, don't worry. You can ask me a question at the end of the session or you can put it in the chat box. But let's deep dive in the designing phase and in the producing phase. Because when we talk about circular economy, we need to think that we need to implement circular economy, not only at the end, when we have huge amount of waste in our warehouses and we don't know what to do, and we are thinking about reusing, repairing, refurbishing. Yeah, that's a solution, but we need to start about circular economy at the beginning, when we purchase and we design what to purchase. And for this, it's so important to start at this point. I will stop here and uh, I would like to give the floor to Ignazio Matteini from uh, UNHCR, who has a lot of experience in this, uh, in circular models and circular approaches and in the designing of circular models. Ignazio, are you with us? Thank you very much. I don't know if you can hear me properly. Yeah, we can. Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, talking about uh, uh, circular economy is, uh, is an invitation I couldn't, uh, I couldn't resist. So thanks for, the, for this opportunity and I, um, I support uh, all what uh, you have uh, said so far and uh, more than mindset, I would call it also culture. So it's a culture of so sustainable supply to change the current mindset and to, and to make a new one. In doing this, uh, I will uh, I will try to uh, to tell the experience of UNHCR very pretty quickly, and uh, uh, also arrive to the to what is today. I mean, I would uh, I would uh, um, I would make a a, um, a cycle. So what we have done so far as uh, agency, 
and come out as uh, what we are doing now in a more integrated uh, uh, way with the support of the other agencies that uh, are working on this. Our mandate is pretty clear. You know what UNHCR does, focuses on, uh, on refugees. And uh, uh, this is, uh, you can see better in the, in the presentation, what we are doing. In order to uh, give life-saving support to refugees, in order to sal salvaguard uh, uh, human rights and to uh, ensure longer solutions, supply has an important role because uh, we are there to make things happen. And uh, when people are starting to flee, we need to be there in a timely, efficient and sustainable manner. Sustainability now is embedded in our own way of doing. Next, please. To uh, ensure sustainability, we had to look at our carbon footprint. We started counting and we made several interesting uh, uh, discoveries. They, one you see the little uh, the dot there is not uh, is not the Davis Cup. I apologize, is uh, uh, they're not tennis balls. But what you see in yellow is uh, the uh, office infrastructure, whatever are the buildings, whatever is the energy, whatever is the travel and the fleet of UNHCR. That is what is called scope one and scope two in terms of uh, of CO two, and that is managed by green in the blue. So this is much more looking at yourself in the mirror and to see what you as an organization have as a carbon footprint and that uh, by in 22 last year was 52 kilotons next please then if you look at the supply you realize that the ball is much bigger we counted it and the last year was 450 kilotons so it's not only core relief items but also the other items that we distribute with the transport and storage and warehouse and you realize what the dimension is so the sustainable supply is much heavier than what you usually think. And this is not what you do for yourself. It's what you do for the refugees and the people of concern. Next, please. When you have this uh, awareness, you need to take action. And to take action, as uh, Michaela was saying, is to build up a strategy. This uh, is flat. You see, it's very flat. It's one, two, three, four, five, four, five. But the five is just the start for the one. So is look in order to have an end to end, you need to look, start with the planning and the design, move toward the market shaping and the sustainable sourcing, focus on the procurement, and then look at the logistical inventory in order to open the floor for the starting again and having a life cycle approach to the quality management. So all these are steps that we have identified. I think they will we will share the with you the uh, this uh, this presentation so you will have it uh, in your uh, in your record. We have shared it with all the agencies. We have uh, these is our action by silos by five silos who in reality is only one and uh, we set a target by 25 reduce our co2 by 20 percent and reduce the plastic that we are using so substituting with the recycled plastic with the natural fibers with different uh, with different approach the spoiler is we have already reached this uh, objective so by now with the changes that we have made and all those uh, lines uh, that are there we have made it we have already reduced the 20 percent by 25. of course the items will have to be entering the cycle of 2024 and 2025 but we reach already more than 23 percent just changing the specifications of the items i will show you what what we have done right away but the spoiler is you can do it and is done already next please this is how we started so this is how we counted the core relief items and how their baseline was. So you go down, you can see blankets and family tents, mattresses, kitchen set. They're all items that I'm sure you're using in your organization. They are the most polluting. Uh, they are made of plastic. They are made uh, of, they were made with uh, uh, old uh, specifications. 
they have uh, a lot of uh, packaging and uh, and uh, um, and the support uh, that was heavy. Next, please. We focused on the specification, as I said. These are all the steps that we have done, uh, dif different steps that we have done. So we have changed grain specification for many of our core relief items so far. Blankets mainly, bucket, jerry cans, sleeping mat, kitchen set, and now solar lanterns, uh, they are uh, the last one. New specification are available. The uh, methodology for uh, assessing their uh, sustainability have been, uh, have been uh, uh, validated. Uh, for instance, a blanket made with recycled plastic, uh, it has a carbon footprint 56% less than the old virgin one. So it's a big step ahead. And we started already some procurement. The good news is that uh, it not only was possible, we, when we started, we said, well, okay, fine, let's make 100% blanket, but we needed to test it. Not only we tested, not only they are available, they are much more thermal efficient than the old one. And believe it or not, they cost less. We have an average of 12% less in the cost of the green blankets than the old one. The next will be mattresses, will be energy, machine, no, the word uh, generators, we will want to hear it. Tents, tarpaulin, canvas, mosquito nets, and so on and so forth. At the same time, we had to look also at the culture, the culture also, and the impact on the on the refugees. So we introduced the green labeling. So uh, as any product, refugees needs to know what they are made of. So we put that they were made of uh, of recycled plastic, they were made of PET or whatever it is the item, and we engage the refugees in the recycling them. So the perspective is to make the end user aware of what the item is and to make it a factor of change in the recycling, reuse and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, further future of the item. The last one here is the warehousing. So we have installed green boxes. We are making a, a assessment of to see how the waste management in the warehouses can be uh, can be improved and how we can improve the packaging. Next, next, please. And in doing this, we have tested with the refugees. We went back to them. We got their feedback and we made a comparative analysis, as I mentioned before, of each item in terms of carbon emissions. The next step is because many of our production is in Southeast Asia, change also the source of uh, and, the, and the geographical um, based of uh, the items that we are buying So from. So the proximity, reducing the transport, reducing uh, the distance. And the last one is the waste management. So uh, always looking at an item before it's produced, after it's delivered as waste. Waste is a negative uh, word in our, in, in, in our world, but is exactly the opposite. Everything can become input if it's uh, properly disposed and properly reused. So mapping uh, the best practices and uh, and uh, uh, looking at the potential suppliers was very difficult at the beginning because everybody was telling us, oh, there is not enough uh, um, recycled plastic available. It's more expensive, 50% and so on. Reality showed that that is not the case. Next, please. They, uh, the other thing we did together with the joint initiative is also about the packaging and the compression. Blankets, we managed to compress to 60% uh, rate, and uh, we, are using, uh, uh, we are using a mix of, of materials in the, in the secondary packing and experience. For instance, uh, uh, kitchen sets into um, recycled uh, food grade uh, um, buckets, and things are really interesting. Uh, the palletizing and the and the optimization of the warehousing is still ongoing, while the packaging has uh, also uh, been successful. We took out the single-use plastic. Sometimes it's just taking them out. For instance, with the with the solar lamps, uh, they are made of plastic. The solar panel is made of plastic. The cable is made of plastic. No need to have all the plastic around in, in order to protect plastic from what? For nothing just smaller packaging, more compressed, 
more closer to the item, no moving, no shaking, and the item is perfect. Uh, the last one was changing our own branding. So we were obsessed with the brand, with the blue, beautiful hands, only white, until we discovered that the pigmentation of the blue is much more polluting. The white coating is very polluting in terms of water and, uh, and CO2. So we just took it out. Its uh, packaging can be recycled cardboard, natural color, recycle and black uh, ink or, uh, or a press uh, uh, stamp. Done, finished, next. And the most important thing is how to think globally. So uh, it's what we said, developing a culture, develop the culture also together in order to have a better standardization of the, of the, of the products, but also of the approach toward the suppliers. For instance, one agency against suppliers doesn't mean a lot. All the agencies, we change the market. We change the industry as such. We focus on the eco relief items. We focus on the green labeling, the packaging, and the waste management. And we do these all together. Think of what the WFP is doing in the research uh, in terms of, uh, of disposal at the end of the process, all the mapping that is done in every country to see how items are disposed. And we cooperate not only with the piggybacking but also trying to combine the different approach. And doing this, sustainability means saving time and money. And next, please. The next step is the call to action. At COP28, we are going, it, we have made a, a, a group of, of uh, uh, voluntary, let's say, agencies under the the uh, the rec and the and the logistic uh, and the logistic uh, uh, cluster and we are presenting uh, a document that uh, aim to change the approach of uh, private sector of governments and donors this is the next step we act together we change ourselves but we need to change also the environment in which we, we serve otherwise the circular economy will not be so much effective thank you very much for this opportunity and I wish you that uh, uh, our experience that is available with all of you might help you to improve also the way we are all doing uh, this job together. Over. Thank you, Ignazio. Okay, a lot of information, a lot of very good example. And uh, I will ask you to stay with us. Uh, I see a lot of questions in the chat box and in five, 10 minutes, we'll have some space for answering to that. And uh, I invite also the attendants and the audience to uh, keep putting questions on the chat box and we'll, uh, we'll have space for that. But uh, now I would like to um, actually I kind of summarize what uh, Ignazio mentioned, right? I mean, he gave a lot of information on how to design these uh, circular products. Uh, and uh, I put here six categories. There are many more, I, I know, but just um, wanted to pick the big one, let's say, the, and also maybe the easy to implement uh, and to see these uh, uh, together. Let's start uh, with the first one, reduce materials. Um, first of all, also something that I didn't mention is that I think it's also very important to understand that to redesign products in a circular way. We don't need to be designer. We don't have to have master in designing. We can simply start from very small steps together with the suppliers, together with the other organization, asking each other how to approach a, a specific issue. So it's doable and it's not so difficult as it looks like. So going back to reduce materials. Uh, actually, I put an example of UNHCR because I think it's very easy to understand the impact they can have. These things of cardboard, cardboards. Before the cardboards were white and blue, and they found out simply that could be brown with uh, the black ink. Those inks can have a huge impact on the environment, and they are not really needed. This is just an example, but we can think about so many other material when we talk about our products, we can make the plastic thinner or the um, cardboard thinner, always thinking about to maintain the quality of the product and durability, absolutely. But there is always a kind of balance between reducing materials 
and maintaining the uh, quality high. Um, making some products smaller. Sometimes we don't realize that we don't need big products, but a smaller, actually, it's exactly the same for us or for the beneficiary that we serve. So these small things that can have an impact. Second area that I would like to mention, reduce packaging. Again, Ignazio already mentioned it. And uh, here, I just want to repeat and give a quick tip. So first of all, removing packaging that is not needed. Here we can see a um, hygiene kit from UNFPA. And we see many items and in each item is uh, has a plastic, a single use plastic bag that is totally not necessary. Maybe yes, there are a few items where the plastic is required, but for the others, there are flip flopping plastic, which is the need there. And uh, this can be a very simple step to put in the specification asking remove single plastic bag and it can have a big impact. Again, we don't need to be designer. We simply need to adopt these small tips. And also um, avoiding packaging that is not recycle, recyclable and maybe adopting also packaging that is reusable. I'm thinking about, I don't know, plastic pallets versus wooden pallets. Plastic pa pallets can be reused over and over again. Now there are more and more solution of uh, um, of packaging that can be used and through reverse logistic use again. Another area, use secondary and recyclable materials. These two two areas, let's say, are included in this category. So the first one, use secondary materials. This means that we can use materials that uh, are not virgin, especially when we talk about plastic, when we talk about paper, we can produce the same products with a percentage of recycled plastic and a percentage of virgin plastic. Depends also, always what I, I, I want you to keep in mind that we don't need to impact the quality of the product, otherwise it doesn't make sense. We need always to maintain the same quality and always to find the right balance between this, this consideration. And then there is the second category that is recyclable material. So we need to use recy recycled materials to produce our products and to make sure that our products then is again recyclable. This means that in the same product, when we design a product, we need to ask to don't use 10 different kinds of, uh, of materials, metals uh, or laminates uh, or plastic together. We need to try to have less material in the same product in order that then when we want to recycle, it's easy to dismantle and it's easy to recycle. And also the material needs to be recyclable. I know that uh, it seems confusing with all these uh, recyclable, recycling. But uh, again, if you have questions, let me know at the end of the session. Um, another category, avoid hazardous and harmful material. Sometimes we don't even realize, but in our products, there are a lot of materials, a lot of um, products that can be very dangerous for the environment. And again, that maybe sometimes are not needed. And thinking again about the ink that we mentioned before, it's very, it, it, the inks are, have huge impact on the environment. And again, are needed or not? That is a question that we need to ask ourselves when designing and purchasing a, pro, a new products. For this, we have the eco labeling that can be very helpful for us and can guide us on which are the um, materials that are harmful or not and can support us in designing better a specific product. Then we have design for durability, and this is what I was mentioning before. In all these categories, when we design a product, we need to make sure always that the product is strong, is durable, and it can stays with us, it can be used for a very long period of time. So we need to make sure that uh, um, the, the, the material are strong enough, that there are not ex a lot of fragile area in the material, 
and uh, we need to uh, make sure that uh, the materials are not you know cheap for example this i think that all of us bought already maybe something cheaper but was for sure not very durable after two to two days it broke and this is the perfect example we need to make sure that maybe we buy maybe something a little bit more expensive but it can have a longer lifespan and then the last category that is collaborate with supplier i know that this means a lot but in my view is one of the most important category because when we design a new product a new circular product we don't have to provide all the solution, but we can ask the supplier what they have already, because maybe they already have solution to propose to us. Maybe they know more than us about that specific product and uh, some specific alternatives. But I will stop here because we have with us the green procurement expert of the REC, who will tell us a little bit more about this connection with the suppliers and how also procurement can play a big role in this. Paola, welcome. Thank you, Michaela, and hi, everyone. Really glad to, to have you join this session. Um, so yeah, I think we just wanted to share with you a few key points uh, to consider practical actions that you can already start taking um, to see how you can implement circular economy. So in terms of collaborating with your suppliers, we need to understand that our suppliers are usually one of the main sources of innovation. So they know what's happening in the market. They know what the um, what their competitors are doing. They know if there's challenges, for example, to source raw materials so that they can make their products. So they're always going to be usually a very, very um, strong source of innovation. So that's where we need to reach out to them, ask them, you know, what solutions are available. Sometimes we already have an idea, but we should always engage with them and understand, first of all, if it is possible, um, what type of cost or time implications it could have, and also if it's aligned to what they can deliver. If we do see that, um, you know, our current suppliers are potentially not able to deliver um, what we're looking for, then we can always engage with other suppliers in the market and understand if it is a possibility. So it's always very healthy to also have that um, that relationship to see what others are doing and and see how it can be implemented within what you require. Then the next point as well is understanding your supplier's supply chain. So you need to know where they are buying from. So for example, if you're working with a supplier that's producing locally, but then they're also importing a lot of raw materials, then that will have an impact in your in you know in your emissions. So you need to understand how they work, um, and then also how their production line works, because that can have that can that can be a space where you can identify solutions. So, uh, for example, if you're looking to change something that's that requires a mold uh, to produce it. So if it's some container of, um, let's say, a plastic container of some type, but it actually requires a mold, and then you decide that you want to make a change in the way that uh, container is, then that would probably be an investment for the supplier uh, to be able to produce it. So those are considerations that you need to take into account. But of course, this is always... Um, this will come to light when you speak to your suppliers and you really understand how they work and and also um, what you're buying is, you know, how it's actually produced. Um, and then, of course, it's al always key to understand if the suppliers that you work with already have environmental targets, if they potentially have circular initiatives in place, um, because that will support you right in driving your your initiatives as well and it also takes me to my fourth point where in some case uh, we can see that organizations are working with the suppliers to build their cap capability so you need to understand where where they are to see if they need um, any type of support as well to build that capability so you can get a sense of how mature or not they are within the space if you if you're working with a supplier that maybe has not even started 
but you are in a situation where you need to keep working with them, then it's about, you know, working as a collaboration for that. Um, and then in addition to that, if you definitely see that your suppliers are not able to do it or they don't want to commit or they're just not incentivized um, in moving, you know, sustainability initiatives, then that's where you do need to assess the market and see what else there is out there and who's actually uh, looking to be aligned to your to your targets. So those are just like a few, um, you know, a few points. I mean, within supplier engagement and green procurement, obviously there's a, a bunch of different other challenges and situations, but um, but yeah, we just wanted to give you high level these points. There's also maybe just something more practical for you to ex access. There are some, um, there is a, a source, a resource available, which is called the Chancery Lane Project. And they actually have um, different types of clauses that you could consider for agreements which are related to sustainability. So this slide, I just put here like a snapshot. Uh, they have like circular economy clauses as well. And when we share the slides, this has a link. So you can also access their website and see in more detail like what proposed contractual clauses uh, they have on that. But yeah, thank you, everyone. If you have questions, please let me know. Thank you, Paola. And uh, thanks also for this practical advice uh, when we talk about uh, collaborating uh, with suppliers. And I'm also very curious to hear from Ignazio about his uh, relationship with, uh, with the suppliers uh, in uh, this uh, designing these new products. Uh, but before jumping to question, I would like just to have a quick menti. Uh, if you can connect menti.com and here there is the link because as rec we want always to hear from you uh, which is your experience which are your initiatives in your organization and which are also your needs that it's very important we are trying to support uh, um, organization in uh, implementing and in designing new circular products and uh, we want to understand which is the focus of, uh, of your organization. So I give you a minute or two to um, connect and uh, I will quickly change the screen. Okay. All right. So I see already some answer so the first question is have your organization already designed or is designing a circular product or is planning also to design a circular product so if no okay if yes which one um yeah again we want to understand already what the organization are doing and um we received already some requests from some uh, organization asking, okay, do you know already who is designing circular kitchen set, for example? And we know that uh, UNSCR is doing that. So it's good to understand who is doing what. Okay. Okay. Yes, he's investing it, but I'm not aware of specific products. We are not, oops, we're not designing the product itself, where we are seeking for circular items to incorporate them in our green uh, catalog at DRC. Very good. Yes, but I'm not aware of the exact products. Uh, I don't know who answered to this question, but please uh, let us know if you know more information about that joint initiative is also or is interested in promoting and sharing your experience and amplifying this very good not yet okay um good to hear that but uh, no problem we are working on that so hopefully also your organization will be more and more interested in this and again just i wanted to highlight again this if you are not doing this yet because you don't know how to start let us know. We are here to support you in this process. 
So my next question is, in what circular projects would your organization be interested? Um, Ignazio mentioned before in his analysis you know, that they, at UNSCR they identified specific products that for the organization would have been much interesting in terms of um, impact on the environment. I don't know if you have a product that you think that could be log items and kits. Exactly. That is um, exactly what we were thinking to focus on uh, on the kits, hygiene kits, shelter items, exactly this. So good to hear that the, the need from the hygiene kits, perfect, very good to hear that. Hygiene kits, wow, well, good. Um, Remanufacture laptops, absolutely. We have also some project related to that. Blankets, shelters, blankets, actually we can learn a lot from uh, UNSCR, we can see and the NFI in general. OK, if you have then uh, more specific uh, um, products in mind, you can let me know. You can send me an email or to the rec um, uh, mailing list. Um, so, sorry, to the rec email or also writing in the chat. OK, last question. Before we saw uh, some aspects to consider, for example, reducing materials, packaging, harmful materials, designing for durability, and so on. I don't know if you see, as I mentioned, we didn't cover everything because it was too much, but I don't know if in your mind you have something that it should be very, imp it's very important to consider that we didn't talk about this. If you think that we covered more or less all the areas, <laughs> I'm happy also. OK, I still give uh, reverse logistics. Good point. These actually the reverse logistic, as mentioned at the beginning, we'll have several sessions to talk about uh, circular economy and uh, mm, today is more focused on the designing of the products and when we will analyze more the uh, supplying phase in the circular economy model, we talk about reverse logistics. So we didn't forget, and I, I'm pretty um, aware of how important it is and how it's important also for the community, dealing with fleet waste. Yeah, again, this one probably is more the other two phases that we'll, uh, we'll talk uh, then in the next session but okay okay i will stop here with this one um and i will go back to the presentation okay and uh, give me a second um okay we are all right to close to the end of the session now we'll have questions and answers just uh, okay uh, just I wanted to mention that we are asking for always for examples on uh, uh, designing circular products. So if you hear about any example, even if it's not in your organization, let us know. We, for us, it's extremely important to know what the community is doing to replicate, to share this information and uh, to provide support. In addition to this, I would like to mention that uh, we have already uh, created a uh, circular economy quick guide. It's very basic information on what circular economy means and is available on our website. Also, you will see here in the link once we'll share the presentation. And uh, also we are working on a quick guide on how to design a circular products and is exactly what we discussed today. A little bit more in detail, so talking about reduced materials, about all the different categories and uh, with uh, some links, with some options already available in the market. And then also we're working on a new documents on circular economy in the UN Internet supply chain. Why, who, how and who? Again, talking about circular economy and to map a little bit who is doing what in the humanitarian context. Um, but yes, in the end, just wanted to mention that we will share the presentation. There will be an NFR of this session that will be shared with uh, all of you. But now I think it's time for question questions. I saw that there are quite a few in the chat box. 
Um, Actually, maybe jumping in, uh, Mick, I am yeah. reading through the chat. Maybe yeah. in chronological order, there was a question for Ignacio from Greece. Uh, what is your advice to NGOs with less purchasing power than UNHCR to approach this? What are the low hanging fruits? Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, I think that there were several questions in in one, and this is one of those. Uh, the advice is start from as we did from the biggest polluters for your case and come down. So deal first with this the biggest uh, the biggest issue. Also consider that some of the items like uh, I didn't talk about the plastic sheeting, but plastic sheeting is under a huge review now, a technical review, the results will be ready at the end of the year. It was UNHCR, ICRC and IFRC. And uh, we have tested uh, these new uh, these new layers. It's, it's a completely different approach. 20% less overall plastic, 20% recycled plastic, durability more than five years. I think it will be the super, the super uh, plastic shipping. So there are items that are developed together. The second issue is the system, acting as a system. Uh, Red Cross uh, has uh, made the catalog. We also have the specification. Look there, their items are available. Their definition, which are which are set, uh, are all there. Uh, let's be an industry. I insist a lot uh, when uh, when we discuss in all these uh, these meetings. We are an industry. We are buying from the same suppliers, and we are there also to educate the suppliers. They another example that you were you were referring, the uh, solar lamp. The solar lamp, the day we said it should be smaller and it should be with recycled plastic, the suppliers were coming and saying, oh, we have this, oh, we have that. We could do this. Uh, what do you think about that? When we said the right to repair, when introduced the, the concept of right to repair, the special uh, screws disappeared immediately. So they all came with the normal screw. They all came with the solution how to host into the solar lantern the actual space for the electronics and the actual space for the for the lamp. So suppliers listen because they know that they depend on us uh, for the business. So our and also our joint uh, call, the first call is for the private sector, which means those who are there innovating, producing and uh, and offering items on the market. So it's extremely important uh, to be to be focused on that in a consolidated way. Over. Thank you, Nyatia. Fra, you, do you want to go through the questions? Yes. Well, there are other questions for Nyatia, but I guess that they're all kind of linked to his answer. So. Uh, how did you work with your suppliers to avoid cost increases? Uh, if I can just complement on this question, how did you work with your suppliers in general? Okay. Did you keep the, first the thing, same? You can't, arrive, you can't arrive to the suppliers not knowing the offer. So we went into the index of the recycled plastic. We assessed the prices and every time they were telling us, oh, it will cost more, we were telling them, sorry, it will cost less. When uh, we were... Uh, uh, they were telling us, oh, this is not possible. It was always, how is it not possible? Other suppliers are doing it. So we, in some way, acted as an industry against another industry. That was the, was the point. And at the end, they are competing They are competing among themselves. So this is something that we need to keep into our, our mind. They're not, they're not uh, uh, by themselves sustainable. They're not by themselves uh, humanitarian. We are the humanitarian. So. It's our interest that the items uh, are less polluting, they cost less, they are more efficient. So they will adapt uh, to the to our demand in order to get uh, to get the the product. But we need to to be clear on what we need, and that is the most important part. I also saw a question about uh, the um, the green uh, the green boxes. Green boxes are just uh, are just uh, uh, electronic device to 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 count how much electricity you use. This goes into the picture, it's counting. Being able to see the difference between a linear product and a product in, in, the, in the chain is also a matter of LCA, of life cycle. So they are, they are uh, uh, the same item that is produced with, uh, with coal 
energy is different from something that is produced with renewable energy, with solar or with uh, or with uh, hydraulic uh, renewable energy. So the item itself looks the same, but actually has a completely different impact in terms of uh, of uh, CO2 and in terms of, uh, of plastic. Thank you, Ignacio. Over. And yeah, this is a message that resonated also at the EAS uh, uh, conference in Catherine and myself attended and uh, actually the private sector was the main stakeholder and we were passing the message that uh, uh, the humanitarians need to come with asks to the private sector and the private sector should actually eventually comply with that because in the end we should start setting the bar for our, what we demand to suppliers. Um, I see that Leila from DRC had a question about hygiene kits. I'm not sure, Leila, if you are here, if you want to take the floor quickly. Yes, uh, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, no, it's because you are seeing now we are uh, working more in uh, we are like, OK, check out or what was our top uh, five of uh, relief items and also at asset items. And so now we are working into it. And one of them is like the, the, hygiene, uh, the hygiene kit. Um, so we know that they have providers already that can uh, facilitate with these period pads that are reusable um, and also tested for non-bacteria and the same for the nappies and probably other items. So we'd like to compile and we'd like to uh, design a full hygiene kit that is with I mean, maybe 70 percent of the, the the product there are recyclable or usable who are just a biodegradable like soap. And so we would like to I would like to know because I see in your uh, action plan that uh, you mentioned that you will work on this uh, initiative as well. Um, did you do already something? Uh, and if the case, can we uh, work together? Or if other organizations today or other agencies are here, if they are working on the same topic, then maybe it would be nice that we can collaborate on this one um, and seek also together for a partnership, etc. And uh, that was for Inetio. <laughs> OK, uh, two things. One is that uh, UN. Uh, oh, I forgot. I, I'm, I'm trying to I'm with acronyms. Um, OK, there are two uh, UN agency who are working very closely on, on those items. And uh, a lot of work has done on the reusable uh, uh, on the re reusable uh, um, menstrual caps on the on the um, on the different kind of naps, nappies that can be used. Uh, so look into into the into the reproductive health. Uh, I think there are developments and uh, and they will be available soon. The second point is to look at plastic. Plastic here is really the the biggest enemy in terms of uh, because you can't recycle, you can't use anything of that. Positive experience that have been done with nappies, with uh, with um, with uh, uh, a lot of uh, of female uh, um, um, uh, sanitary uh, nappy, napkins made of banana leaf, made of uh, of uh, uh, bamboo instead than of plastic, fully hundred percent recyclable. And uh, and also becoming fertilizers one dispose uh, in the right way. The issue is the cost. So what is the kind of of market is for that? And is the humanitarian only the only one, or it should be the overall industry that should move in that direction? So uh, until we have not moved pull in that direction will be always an issue of of of, of, of price and the price in those items is really high yeah thanks um may i ask a question in yet i know that actually all questions are for you but um you were mentioning at the beginning that you defined the products that were the most polluting May I ask you quickly, how did you do that? Especially, I mean, did you do it in house? Did you ask external partners? And also thinking that maybe uh, sm small NGOs don't have such a capacity capacity to calculate that, which is your advice? Uh, 
Okay, this is also linked to the investment. That was our yeah. initial investment. We yeah. had an external partner. We made a huge assessment and, and we went with that. Then we learned ourselves. So in the last year and a half, we have internalized everything and we and we moved on with our own uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, what we do now and what I suggest everybody is again to make is not is not the pioneers anymore. There are good uh, good example. There is a, we have a working group among uh, among agencies and among uh, um, among the all the initiatives. I think that there is the also the carbon accelerator that is doing uh, a, a great a great uh, job. They are uh, su very supportive and they are able to help those who don't have the internal capacity to to look at their uh, CO2 footprint uh, to help you with that. But uh, items are polluting. So consider that every organization start from the point that what I showed to you at the beginning, the actual impact of uh, your as an organization and the impact of your supply are really two different uh, dimensions. So while every manager in the organization thinks I need to be good because uh, it's uh, I look myself in the mirror, it's uh, what I pollute. Nobody look at what is the pollution that we do with our item, with our relief action. That is the focus, and that is uh, that is important. That is changing in our view is uh, expanded as much as possible. Yeah, thank you very much. And also going back to what Leila said, also like uh, I I know that DRC doesn't have the capacity to do such an assessment to understand which is the most polluting, but uh, talking with Leila was more like, okay, what DRC is purchasing a lot, okay? Like, let's try to understand what what we have, what we can do, right? And we start, uh, she decided to start and, uh, with you the can share, You can share the our presentation there, it's pretty clear. Yeah. Those, uh, those impact is the impact of virgin uh, blankets, of tents, of uh, all, all of that is there. So you change the amount that you spend for that and you see what is uh, the amount and what is most relevant for you. Th those items are, <laughs> are uh, basic. So the yeah. rest uh, can't. Textile. All the textile, all the clothing is very high in terms of uh, of uh, CO2 in terms of plastic. OK, so also consider that as a as uh, as one. Perfect. Thank you very much. I think uh, we have time for one last question if we have and then that's let's see. Maybe for yeah. for park condition, let's say to give a question to Paula. I see that Paul from the Fleet Forum was asking, sure. would it be better uh, okay, uh, yeah, Paula, would it be better to collaborate with local suppliers to transition them to circular solutions than to work with an international supplier who is able to already offer circular solutions? Yeah, I gave a, I put a bit of an answer on the chat and to, to add to that. So basically, I think we need to try and do it wherever it is, either internationally or locally, because um, any effort that you can take will make a change. But what's key as well is to understand where your highest impact is um, and you start tackling that area instead of trying to look at every single supplier and try to make a change in every single one because you won't actually be able to achieve an impact as quickly as you can so it's very dependent on the category um, you know what you're buying because also the supply chain has different levels of complexity so it's very different to buy fleet versus buying printed materials locally right so you know fleet you'll most likely have to work more with global companies but whereas printing you probably can buy locally and that's where you can you know work with local printers that can actually have some type of uh, circular uh, supply chain so i think it's very dependent on on what you're looking at really I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much, Paola. And uh, I think we need to close uh, here the session, but uh, please uh, let us know if you have uh, additional questions, doubts, or you need uh, support. As uh, I, we always mention, uh, we are here at track to support you and to share information and good practices. Uh, here you see the email of REC, so please uh, reach out to us there. And uh, yes, you will receive again uh, the presentation and NFR of the session. 
and uh, see you in uh, in 2024 for the next session on uh, circular economy. Thanks, uh, Ignazio, for sharing your expertise uh, with us and uh, Paola as well. And uh, I wish you a very good day and week. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day.